Obvious, we are doing a biography today. Elon Musk, Tesla, SpaceX, and the quest for a fantastic future. One quote, we'll start with a quote here. Optimism, pessimism, fuck that, we're going to make it happen. This was a recent quote from the man himself, and I think it encapsulates kind of what he's about. Elon Musk is, of course, the richest man in the world, and in 2021, or for 2021, he will pay the most in taxes of any human being in history. His company Tesla just absolutely obliterated car deliveries as of a few days ago, and his primary mission in life is to make humans an interplanetary species. The guy is driven. So as always, we will go through the contents, and then we'll talk about an analysis, which discusses kind of the value of the book itself, and then we'll go into some big picture stuff to tie it all together. And as I mentioned before, I think in my last episode, uh, there's a new book that will be coming out within the next couple of weeks, and I hope you will take a look at that. But otherwise, let's get into the content. <laughs> Five boys. He's got five boys. <laughs> the rigid part of his schedule, he makes sure to spend two days at SpaceX and two days at Tesla in a week, as of the writing of this book anyway. And he suggests that girls need five to ten hours a week, so that's something that you have to work in. I give them five to ten hours a week, whether it's a girlfriend or a wife. From other sources, I glean that Elon Musk will work 80 to 100 hours a week. And remember, he doesn't just have the Tesla and the SpaceX. He's got the Boring Company and Neuralink as well. And apparently, I just uh, learned, he allegedly has an asteroid mining company. And he had talked about this before, as an interest is to uh, mine asteroids for trillions of dollars worth of minerals. It made me think of the Spanish explorers bringing back piles and piles of gold and what that did to Spain, but, uh, you know, we shall see how it affects the American markets. So some of his background, he was born in South Africa, he is an African American, his grandfather was apparently into flying and went on many adventures in this vein and it made an impression on the young Elon, and when Elon was a kid he would go into these dreamlike states where he had an uncanny ability to be able to visualize problems so he could look at something in his mind and be able to see all the the parts of it and how to fix the problems that were attendant to it. When they were kids, the boys went to live with their father, Errol Musk, at one point, and something bad apparently happened there, which has yet to be fully divulged, but it involved, apparently, psychological torture. He said his father was completely nuts. He would lecture at them for hours and make their lives miserable, and if there was anything good, he would make sure to make it unhappy. So there could have been a lot of, uh, you know, psychological alchemy that was going on there. And obviously, if it's if it's Elon's father, something of that is likely in Elon himself. That is part of the reason, part of what made him what he is. At 10 years old, he saw his first computer. And throughout his childhood, he was severely bullied. That's something that he's talked about in interviews on a regular occasion. Then we get his companies. When he starts starting companies, he goes to Canada. He wants to move to the United States. He goes there via Canada. And eventually he starts with his company. Zip2 was an early company that he created. It was supposed to connect businesses to the internet. Being ahead on that curve. His brother Kimball Musk sold. I'd, every picture of Kimball I've seen, he's, been wearing, he's worn a cowboy hat. But Kimball Musk did the selling for the company and Elon coded. And this is... A, the time in his life where he famously slept in the office, which he talked about in interviews. Then we get X.com, which would eventually merge with Confinity and would be become PayPal in March of 2000. And this is where he first had to deal with some of the uh, corporate bureaucracy that comes with big uh, internet type companies. So there's a, a coup launched against him and they replaced Musk with Peter Thiel, but Moss bought more shares of the company and eventually it sold to eBay. PayPal sold to eBay for $1.5 billion. When Zip2 was sold, he made you know a little bit of money he got to live off of, but when PayPal was sold, that's when he really had money to be able to try to do something. So around this time, he went to Russia to buy rockets, and apparently they didn't take him very seriously. And he founded SpaceX around June of 2002. One of the big developments that would impact his companies around this time was the realization that lithium-ion batteries were far superior to lead-acid batteries. So we would do these visualizations on spreadsheets of the things he would later build. Then we get early Tesla. They decided right away that SUVs and delivery trucks were unlikely based on the way the batteries would function and that a high-end sports car would be a better option. So that's the earliest Tesla's high-end sports cars. We're still waiting on the Roadster, but that's coming down the pipe. That thing is beautiful. But it, insanely fast. Prius had started to take off around this time. I remember the Prius days. But they realized the average income for EV owners was around 200000 per year, so that impacted how they were going to design the Tesla. 
but it was actually uh, Eberhard who had Tesla and had come up with the name uh, while with on a trip with his wife at Disney. He came up with the idea of the name of Tesla Motors, and it was January 2004 where when he was seeking venture capital and developed the idea to try to pitch Musk. So Musk gave over $6.5 million and became the largest shareholder, and they planned on delivering the Roadster 2006 to 2007. They tried to go to Detroit around this time, but the bureaucracy was apparently crazy. And this is an extremely important lesson. (laughs) Whatever the honeyed phrases of bureaucrats, politicians, whatever they want to use, reality will eventually smack them right in the face. It would have been a huge boon for Detroit to have Tesla, especially as of today. But those kinds of things matter. When you have a bureaucracy that acts very slowly or arbitrarily, then you're going to push out things that are going to be beneficial to your community. So the approach here was uh, to fail fast. And this is one thing that was discussed in the book. You fail fast and then try something new. And that's what they tried to do at Tesla. They had to completely restart the transmission from scratch in January of 2008. This was after they had said that they wanted to deliver a Roadster in 2006-2007. And they they hired this uh, guy to do an efficiency check on the development of this car. And they determined that they would have to price the car around $170,000. You know, a lot of speed bumps on the way to delivering the early Teslas. And as a result of this, I believe, uh, you know, when they did this efficiency check, they demoted Eberhardt for mismanagement, and then they kind of instituted uh, new methods for designing and producing these cars. Part of that method was uh, how Musk was, and this is an important part of the book. Like, there was this one instance where this employee skipped a day of work to go to the to their birth of their child. You know, obviously a significant milestone in anybody's life, but he received a hostile email from Musk as a result of that. And if you were in a meeting and you said the standard way of doing something, then you'd get kicked out of the meeting. This chapter was titled Pain, Suffering, and Survival, and it has a lot of the headaches swirling uh, his personal life and his companies at the time. He did get to meet Robert Downey Jr., though, uh, around this period, and I remember I just watched, rewatched the first Iron Man movie, and they had, was it in the first, it was one of the Iron Man movies, they had a cameo from Elon Musk, but Robert Downey Jr. met Elon Musk and based a lot of the character of Tony Stark on who Elon Musk was. And a Tesla Roadster was actually placed in one of the Iron Man movies. But he he's becoming more of a public figure at this time. And that doesn't just have the positives of getting to meet Robert Downey Jr. It has some of the drawbacks, uh, such as his wife at the time, Justine Musk, started blogging about celebrities and, and Musk. The concern about the companies, you know, there was a second rocket failure at SpaceX and almost nothing had been accomplished at Tesla yet. They had triplets and Justine had postpartum depression after the triplets. And they would have these spats, such as uh, Justine got annoyed that she was just seen as Musk's wife. She wanted to be recognized in her own right. And she demanded that she be introduced to people as a published novelist. So in response to this, Elon Musk introduced her by saying, Justine wants me to tell you she has published novels. So this wasn't healthy either way. (laughs) This wasn't a good way for either one of them to be behaving in this marriage. But the companies and Musk were running out of money. In June 2008, Musk filed for a divorce, and Justine wrote blogs about it. He met Tallulah Riley in England. She was an actress. She was in Pride and Prejudice, I think. She was 22 at the time. And meanwhile, at the company, SpaceX was having a number of issues. There's one issue where they were just transporting one of the rockets. And when the plane that was holding the rocket descended, the rocket crushed like a water bottle because of the change in pressure. But it took four and a half more years than predicted to be able to get a functional rocket. So the money problems continued. They were spending $4 million per month at Tesla. He ended up having to borrow money from friends in late 2008. It'd be great to have friends like that. He could borrow that kind of money to keep Tesla running. They got to work on this NASA award for a contract for the ISS resupply that was vital. In December 2008, they were almost bankrupt at SpaceX. But apparently Musk gets hyper-rational under pressure. And more of his method when he's running these companies is that he interviews almost every single employee at SpaceX. And he would present them with a riddle. The riddle is, where in the world can you walk one mile north, one mile east, then one mile south, and end up where you started? And uh, just to give you the answer, the North Pole. So if ever you're interviewing for Tesla, now you can answer that riddle. I'm sure he's changed it now because now it's all over the internet. But the way it was designed, Tesla was designed, he made it so you had to walk through... As an employee, you had to walk through the manufacturing area to be able to get to, you know, the more corporate areas. 
so you'd have an appreciation for the manufacturing of the product. And they did 90% in-house manufacturing. There were multiple instances where they demonstrate that you can do it better if you do it yourself. There was one employee named Davis who worked 16-hour days. Musk actually called Stanford and asked if there were any grad students who worked hard and didn't have families. And he got this guy, Davis. And there was this instance where he had to, they needed an, an actuator for the Falcon 1. And Davis got a quote of $120,000 from a third party. And Musk said, no, you have $5,000. Uh, it's no more complex than a garage door opener. Figure it out. And he did. So that was a, a big part of the culture at Tesla. But just to keep in mind, this is what Musk's ultimate goal is. He was all about Mars. Uh, he talked about how it would take like a thousand years to terraform it. And you'd have to be able to use the elements that are on Mars, and that would be a very important part of it. His wife actually said that Musk wanted to be the first life on Mars, but there was some dispute about that. He said that he wanted to wait until it was established, and then he'd go there. But regardless, that's the ultimate goal of all of this stuff, is to get to Mars. Some of his other projects that were going on at the time, there was the Hyperloop in Los Angeles that was supposed to go from LA to San Francisco. It was supposed to go 800 miles per hour and be solar-powered, and you're supposed to be able to take your car down in there and just be able to shoot that straight across and there's supposed to be tunnels underneath la so that you could avoid traffic it would be like a car subway i watched a couple of videos on this and we'll talk about it later but it doesn't seem to have come to fruition but uh you know it wasn't all frivolity and backslapping you know, at these various companies he was actually accused by a number of employees of having a lack of loyalty and human connection there was one employee in particular that was fired, uh, Mary Beth Brown. She was there for over a decade as his assistant. And at a certain point, she said she wanted more compensation. Remember, they're over a decade. <laughs> so he told her to take a couple of weeks off, and he would do her job to see how hard it was. And when she returned, he said that she wasn't needed anymore. So the optics of this were just terrible. And I watched n numerous interviews where he talked about firing employees and with employees who had been fired. Apparently he's, he will wantonly do that whenever necessary. And he would obsess over typos and emails uh, rather than the <laughs> substance of the emails. He obsessed over that too, I'm sure. But uh, even just typos he would obsess over. But his closest friends and family said that he acted very differently with them. He would exhibit that kind of uh, loyalty and affection to those people and have those connections to those, but not to his employees necessarily. And the author put him in the profoundly gifted psychological category and suggested that it's not that he hates people, it's that he is pained by their mistakes. And one thing he was very worried about, especially for his own kids, speaking about his family, was that he was worried that they wouldn't have adversity. Uh, that there was no adversity in their lives and that would be that would undermine their, their ability to be able to develop the kind of character that they needed and he suggested that all smart people need to have kids at least at replacement that it's very important he wouldn't let his kids play stupid games and he made them make sure to read more than they played games you know video games or otherwise and one of the uh, last things that he talks about is that he would like to die on mars just not on impact that's much of what the book has to talk about. There's obviously um, much, much more in that. I just tried to pick out a number of things that stuck out to me, and we will move into the analysis at this point. And I apologize. Like, I got something. I don't know what is going on with me. But it is making it very hard to speak clearly about anything. But I don't want to miss a week for the entirety of 2022 i want to make sure to get these things out so uh you know of course first week has to be like this but the analysis we don't really have biographies to compare to to determine how much was uh included how much was missed this is the only authorized biography as far as i'm aware this one was authorized and this is the only one that was authorized i want to read it again i'm going to go through it again to see what else i can pull out of it I did thoroughly enjoy it. You know, I just enjoyed learning about Elon Musk in general. I thought it was written reasonably well. You know, it has details about his life. It really kind of goes into who he is. It does seem like it may have pulled some punches, but it's by no means just being fawning or anything like that. And it seems like on the face of it, it's a story that shows, you know, the early struggle to grand success. Of course, he's the richest man in the world now, so that's got to be the story. But 
You know, I don't know if this needs an update or what later biographies are going to talk about. The Boring Company that was supposed to be making the Hyperloop hasn't succeeded. As far as I know, it's actually doing very poorly. It has done very little, has accomplished very little when it comes to what it was trying to accomplish. Uh, Neuralink has yet to do anything of note as far as I know. There was some video related to, uh, I think there was a monkey that was playing Pong via Neuralink or something like that. But I'm not sure how much they're actually accomplishing over there and you know as of a couple of months ago when i looked into it spacex was on the verge of bankruptcy (laughs) there were some real serious issues related to spacex uh and and funding of spacex and what they're going to be able to do going forward tesla's doing great (laughs) so at least there's that as of very recently tesla is doing fantastic they had some kind of a recall that caused an issue and the big man of the uh, the 2008 collapse who made billions of dollars off of that collapse by by shorting what's his name michael burry is that what it is he shorted he famously has shorted Tesla and said it's going it's going under it's a, a terrible stock and he's he's trying to make you know those billions again but most recently they absolutely destroyed the numbers on deliveries on car deliveries which showed which showed tremendous demand and a tremendous ability to up their production but the other co- the other companies are struggling <laughs> so uh, we'll see how it all shakes out So you have to question, is this truly the great man archetype? As a book, as a story of Elon Musk, is it truly that? Or is it somebody who pushes everything and lives on the edge and, you know, has a lot of, had a lot of uh, space before in the numbers because there's just so much money involved. But as you scale it up, does he really accomplish much in the long run? Is Is he really a great man, a great driver of advancement? I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say the guy's amazing. He's accomplished incredible things. But there's certainly more to the story uh, that will come in the future. In the book, like I said, it seems balanced. It was it was definitely worth the read. And I'm going to give it another read at some point. Okay, to talk about some big picture stuff. The Great Man Archetype. It can also be a woman, obviously. But uh, the Great Man Archetype, it's, it's been a vital artifact of history for the duration of our species. Whether it's mostly or partially fiction, that it's great men who drive forward history, or not, you know, whether they are absolutely necessary. Uh, We read Taleb, who dropped a couple notches for me because he was, like, advocating medical tyranny (laughs) online, but what are you going to do? But he discussed how little we know, you know, as humans, how many limitations we have cognitively, and how important luck is. Uh, There was another one who talked about that, too, how important luck is when determining how things come about. So when it comes to the great man theory of history, you must wonder how much is luck, how much is circumstance, and how much is inevitable. So do great men drive history, or do they merely become the repository of the fruits of history? Something like the electric car revolution is something that seems like it would have occurred anyway, but Musk was there to push it faster along than it would have otherwise happened. So to further explore this question, uh, we will be reading the seminal biography of another great man, Steve Jobs, coming next week. Of course, we probably would have wanted to do these in reverse order, but, you know, there you go. I mean, as with anything, it's likely going to be some combination of the two. Musk is a singular human being that seems unbelievably driven and intelligent and capable of holding a whole bunch of different strands of disciplines, you know, to himself at one time so that he can tie them all together. So we'll see, though. Also, on YouTube and Rumble, I'm going to be publishing these conversations with artificial intelligence. What we're doing is trying to explore the structure of the responses to see where the tech is. At the same time, I'm trying to learn (laughs) just computer coding. I I know very little of it. We're trying to get Python down so we can explore this more carefully. But I appreciate anybody who wants to take a look at that. Like I said, I have the book coming up, and we'll talk about more about that uh, when we get there. Otherwise, uh, this is number one for 2022, which is going to be a big year. It's already started off. (laughs) I mean, the slings and arrows of the first three days of this year, I can't even begin to describe. But I am uh, taking a beating, and we're going to see how we come out the other end. Uh, I hope everything has been good for everybody else, though, and I will see you on the next one. All right, bye. (laughs) 